Well, good morning, New Community Church. Whether you are part of the uh, the Central Congregation live stream or whether you are in person at St Andrew's Shoaling, it's great to uh, to be with you and to share with you today. I was uh, really moved a few months back when Billy got in touch to ask if I could take part in your Pentecost celebrations and uh, really delighted to say yes. Uh, Billy and Caroline have been good friends to us uh, since we arrived here in Southampton nearly 17 years ago and we've loved uh, working with them and with Theo and Adam and others uh, in SCN over these years. A couple of weeks back, uh, it was a, a tricky day, and uh, my wife Alison was seeking God and asking him to, to speak to her about our church. And uh, to her surprise, she felt the Holy Spirit saying for the church just these very simple words, you're beautiful and God delights in you. You're beautiful and God delights in you. And I want to say to you at New Community Church today, whether you feel this right now in this difficult season or not, I want to say it to you and speak it over you. You're beautiful and God delights in you. And I want to say that we are really glad to be your friends as well. And because we value this relationship so much, it really is a huge joy to share today in uh, your Pentecost celebrations as we both remember the, the one day of Pentecost in history a couple of thousand years ago, and also as we gather together to enjoy the continuing dynamic of Pentecost as we receive the Father's today gift of the Holy Spirit, his living, powerful, dynamic, intimate, transforming presence. Our God is, as Paul reminds us in 1 Thessalonians 4, the God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Present tense, he gives you his Holy Spirit. He's giving the Spirit to the church every day. And today on Pentecost Sunday, we're here together to celebrate that and to enjoy it as the people of God. The Christians in in Corinth thought that they were pretty much on the money when it came to the things of the Spirit. And in many ways, they were. They, uh, They loved how powerful their leaders seemed, and they enjoyed the freedoms that they had as New Covenant believers. The gifts of the Spirit flowed freely among them, and that's something that Paul clearly celebrates in the letter that we call 1 Corinthians. So I wonder how it was for those house churches in Corinth when they first received this letter, and they got to chapter 3 and verse 1, and it says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I wonder how they responded to Paul's challenge to them. It's huge, isn't it? Well, I don't believe for a minute that Paul was telling them to kind of dial down on spiritual gifts or to uh, to, to give up on, on bold faith. I don't think it was that at all. But But what was he saying to this, in some ways, very spiritual and alive, even if troubled, church. What was it he was saying? Well, thankfully, we know the answer because he tells us in verse 3, you are still worldly because since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? And I think that takes us right to the heart of our theme today. The Holy Spirit, whose coming we celebrate on this Pentecost Sunday, is the spirit of unity. The spirit who is grieved by quarreling, who's quenched by selfish ambition, who's sidelined by factionalism and rivalry. The spirit of unity. The agenda of the Holy Spirit is not to build a series of cliques based around human personality, which is something of what was going on in Corinth, but to build the one church of Jesus Christ. And that is the driving heart of everyone who is truly living in the spirit, to build the one church of Jesus. Not to create a following, but to build Jesus' church and not their own. 
I think that's part of why being part of your Pentecost celebrations today is, is so significant for me. You see, the New Testament never refers to the churches, plural, in any given city, but only of the church, singular, one church in the city. Even though it's pretty clear that in most cities, uh, the church met in multiple house churches of one kind or another. Uh, some of the scholars say that they think in Corinth there were at least seven house churches meeting. And yet still, at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, Paul speaks to the church of God in Corinth, the one church. And in a rather similar way, here in Southampton, there is New Community Church, there is a Baba Church, there is Lighthouse Church, St Mary's, Covenant Life, City Life, Life Church, and many others as well. But there is one church of Jesus, united across those and many other churches. And today, as we're together in our celebration of Pentecost, is a prophetic declaration and expression of that fundamental unity that exists. So in that spirit, I want to uh, say three things uh, from the passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, about this one church that the Holy Spirit wants to build. And uh, each is based on the, uh, the different pictures that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 3 to, to describe the church that the Holy Spirit is building. The first picture is the picture of the field in verses 5 to 9. And the point from this is that God grows the one church. God grows the one church. Just to put it in context, Christians in Corinth loved impressive leaders, especially leaders who were impressive in speech, very eloquent and sophisticated in what they said. It was actually part of the, uh, the culture of their city that they hadn't quite kind of dealt with uh, or come to terms with. They were, they were into fine speech and rhetoric and philosophy, and they wanted great leaders that reflected that. Now, I want to say today, thank you to God for leaders of his church, especially right now when, to be honest, it's, it's pretty tough to lead a church. But the moment we start focusing on how wonderful our leaders are, we are likely to start forgetting something that's much more important, which is that it's not them but God who grows the church. Have a look at verses 5 and 6 of 1 Corinthians 3, where Paul says, What after all is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. God has been making it grow. And then just in case we didn't get it, verse 7, So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters, the leaders, is anything, but only God who makes things grow. It couldn't be clearer, could it? God grows the one church. It's him that does it. The church is God's field, and he is the agent of its growth. And therefore, even the best and most able and most eloquent of leaders are no more than servants within God's field. That's a great thing to be. But that's all that any of us are who lead within the church of Jesus. So for those of you in new community who, who are leaders and who sometimes lie awake at night wondering how much of the church that you've helped to build will still be there when all this is over and we gather together and we look back on the pandemic and we look around and, and we think, well, well what, is, what is our church now? If you're, if you're in that position and sometimes you... You feel worried about it, as I think many of us do. Let me say, just remember, it wasn't actually you who grew the church. It was God who did it. And if he did it before, he can do it again. The pandemic hasn't put Pentecost into reverse. The pandemic hasn't sent God into blind panic. No, our confidence for the future is not in ourselves our ability, our great leaders, our great gifts, our ability to turn things around after a tough time. Now, our confidence for the future is in God and in his heart to grow and build his church. God grows the church. And 
to the rest of the church family at New Community, I want to say, do honour your leaders. But please remember that they can't grow the church. That's God's job. Now, maybe they can, they can kind of get bums on seats um, if they do certain things. But, but that isn't the growth that we're talking about here. It's not the same thing. The growth that counts, the growth that lasts, the growth that delights the heart of God is supernatural in its very essence. It's God's own work. God grows the church. And the task of leaders is to serve with patience and with faithfulness and to wait and look for the harvest. God grows his church and leaders are just servants. But then in verses 10 to 15, there's another image. It's the image of the building. And the point that we're getting at here is that Jesus gives the church its shape. God grows the church, but Jesus shapes the one church. Four years on from the the scandal of Grenfell Tower, I think we know more than ever the disaster of shoddy building when that building gets tested by fire. And of course, from the news this week, it seems that a big part of the problem at Grenfell was that scrutiny was focused on the wrong issue. People were more concerned, it seems, with the colour of the panels than whether or not they were able to resist a fire, or at least that's what's been reported. That's a particularly tragic and and painful image, and I, I don't want in any way to misuse it, but it isn't a bad image for what sometimes happens in the church where we focus on all the wrong things, the superficial things, and we neglect to actually ask, what is the shape that Jesus wants for his church? We're not thinking about whether we're building well. You see, in Corinth, people did want to build the church, but they were focusing on the wrong stuff, a little bit like worrying about the color of the panels on the tower, the stuff that they just happened to be into in their culture. That's what was preoccupying them, how brilliant their leaders were and what good speakers they were. And no, they needed to stop and ask what shape Jesus wanted for his church. They needed to ask, are they building with care? Are they building properly? Verse 10, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it's about the foundations on which we build, because we all know that if the foundations of a building are not sound, the building won't last. Verse 11, no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. But it isn't just the foundations. It's what we build on those foundations too. Verse 12, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Fire does that in buildings, doesn't it? It tests the reality of what has been built. What exactly Paul means here, he doesn't explain right now, but I think he doesn't do that because he's already told us in chapter one. He's basically said there towards the end of chapter one, look, if you build a church around human personalities, then the fire of God's judgment will bring it to nothing. Chapter one, verse 28. But build it around Jesus and the message of the cross and the demonstration of the Spirit's power and you'll be building something that lasts forever. The foundations on which we build, Jesus. And the material with which we build, the shape of the whole building, Jesus. The message of the cross, the presence and power of the Spirit. It's a bit like uh, that old seaside rock image, isn't it? That wherever you cut into the church, you should find the same thing everywhere. Not fads and favourites, but Jesus and his good news and the demonstration of the Spirit's power. Because that's the kind of church that the Holy Spirit wants to build. Jesus shapes the church. So we need to be careful how we build with him, not just doing our own thing. And then the final picture comes in verses 16 and 17. It's the picture of the temple. And here the point is that the Spirit fills 
the one church. God grows the one church. Jesus shapes the one church. The Spirit fills the one church. Uh, Each morning at the moment, I'm uh, reading through the book of 1 Kings. And fairly early on in 1 Kings, there are somewhere like five chapters worth of detail about Solomon building the temple there in Jerusalem. And roughly in the middle, in chapter 8 and verse 10, when the building is finished and the Ark of the Covenant has been brought inside, we read this, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord and the priests could not perform their services because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. The glory of the Lord filled his temple. What a moment that must have been. Don't you, don't you wish that you had been there to, to witness the cloud, to sense the majesty of God invading this building that had been put up for his glory and the priest trembling with awe before him. Fantastic. But this was the key moment because actually that's what the temple was all about. It was the dwelling place of God among his people. The cloud was the evidence that God was moving in among the community of Israel, to live among his people. And of course, that is what turned them from just merely a bunch of people into the people of God. It's what transformed a nation into a holy nation. God was there. He'd filled his temple. And of course, the day of Pentecost is the New Testament equivalent of that. Because at Pentecost, the glory of the Lord descended on the church of Jesus Christ, the new temple. As that church was baptized with his Holy Spirit and clothed with the power of God, he came to live among his people. That's what Paul is describing in chapter 3, verse 16 of 1 Corinthians. Don't you know that you yourselves, that's like you together, plural, you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives among you. And this Pentecost Sunday, I'm challenging myself and I'm calling us all to recapture a supernatural understanding of the very nature of the church and to make this our passion, our joy, our expectation. We are not just buildings littered around the city. We are not just communities and clubs. We are the supernatural people of God. He lives among us by his spirit. The glory of the Lord has filled his temple because the spirit has been given to the church. Whether it's my style or not, whether I like the speaker, whether our church is the coolest gig in town or not, whether we're riding the wave or all the latest things, all that stuff, frankly, is distraction. It's like worrying about the color of the panels instead of whether they're the right panels in the first place. Now, what matters is none of that stuff, but that God is among us. What matters is that when we come together, we encounter him and drink in his presence. What matters is that we stand in awe of his holiness, that we are captured by his love, that we're transformed by his grace, that we're mobilized by his power. Oh, friends, we need to recapture this. The lockdown has been so hard for us all, hasn't it? As we've had to cope with month after month of a church in the lounge in front of a TV, and it's not quite what we want out of church. We're grateful for it, but... We know there's so much more. There's something so wonderful when the people of God gather and God dwells within us, yes, but among us as well, as together we are his temple. So when the time comes and we are all back together, let's embrace this in a fresh and powerful way, this supernatural understanding of the very nature of the church. God has moved into the community of his people, for he has given his spirit. When you do that, you'll know that the church isn't just a convenient thing to kick when you're feeling grouchy. It isn't just a club to meet my needs and match my preferences. It isn't a community that I'm at liberty to divide so as to get a following for me and my ideas. No, it's it's a holy thing. It's a sacred community. It's something to treasure and to protect and to build and never something to divide or diminish or destroy. It's exactly what Paul says in verse 17, isn't it? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are 
that temple. The Holy Spirit loves to build the one church. God the Father grows the church. Jesus the Son gives the church its true shape and authenticity. The Holy Spirit fills the one church as God's glory comes to dwell among his people. So on this Pentecost Sunday, let's make sure that we are tuned in to the agenda of the Holy Spirit by committing to love what he loves, to build what he is building, and to protect what is sacred to him. He wants one united church across our city in all our different expressions and emphases. One church which the Father is growing. One church which is built on Jesus and shaped by his good news. One church filled with the power and presence of his Spirit, united together to change this city for Jesus. Let's pray together, shall we? Our Father, on this Pentecost Sunday, we want to praise you for the gift of your Holy Spirit to the church. We want to savour that gift. We want to encounter your presence among us powerfully. We want to be more hungry for you, more expectant of you, more responsive to you. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, build the one church of Jesus across our city. And we give ourselves to you as your servants, that we may build and work with you. We ask it for the glory of Jesus. Amen.